Hello there. Uh, welcome back to Grade Ten Economics. And in this video, we want to look at a question paper, and that is a past exam paper, and we are going to look at paper two. So we are going to look uh, at a uh, question two according to that question paper, and the question is on micro economics. So our question is got forty marks, and it requires you to spend on average thirty minutes uh, on that question. So um, question two point one reads answer the following questions. I will give the first part 2.1.1, which is a list two factors affecting supply. So um, we know that our supply, uh, the explanation that we have in terms of supply is that it is the total amount of a specific good or service that is available to consumers. So we go to the market, we see the uh, the, the total amount of that good that is available uh, is uh, the supply. So uh, it's, so supply is determined from the point of view of the um, firms or businesses uh, that are producing that product. So that's where we determine uh, the supply. So um, our question is got uh, two marks and uh, it requires uh, two points. So it means you have to raise to two points and then uh, each point with uh, one mark. So um, all the factors affecting uh, supply, uh, remember we can have also cost of production and uh, determine supply. If we've got a uh, uh, more uh, uh, cost of production facing uh, if firms are facing high cost of production, obviously it becomes expensive to produce. So they are going to contract the production, we're going to have supply uh, decreasing. So um, going to our answer section, I uh, will see that uh, these are the factors that we have uh, that is changing uh, in industry size. So what is the first one? So if we have got a, a larger industry, it means also uh, the uh, goods that are going to be produced will be more and supply will increase. But if the industry is, is small, uh, supply will uh, also decrease. So change in production techniques also. Uh, if you have got modern production techniques that are being applied, uh, which means that they are going to uh, enhance efficiency in production and more goods will be uh, um, uh, produced. But if you are using outdated uh, production techniques, obviously uh, production will decrease because uh, obviously uh, outdated production techniques are associated uh, with inefficiencies. So um, we go to the next one, cost of production. This is the one that we've just explained. And then we could also government policy as a factor. So government policy, we can explain it from the point of view of fiscal policy. Remember, our fiscal policy uh, is set by the government. So um, we, we can explain it from the point of view of government expenditure. Remember, fiscal policy uses two main instruments that we could government expenditure and taxation. So, for in, from the point of view of government expenditure, if the government increases increases its government expenditure in terms of um, uh, subsidies, uh, that is, uh, funds given to uh, firms that are facing a cost of production, that cost of production goes down, it means they are also going to uh, have uh, less uh, cost of production and then they expand their production. We are going, going to have more, more supply of goods. Uh, so uh, that is what we have from the point of view of a uh, uh, government expenditure. Then uh, uh, from taxation point of view, uh, they, the government, if the government increases the taxation, it means also uh, the cost of production is going to increase uh, because uh, the firms that are buying those uh, inputs or raw materials uh, will be um, are buying at a higher price, so cost of production will increase and also uh, production capacities will decrease. So this is what we have in terms of our data affecting supply. So going back to the question, uh, we see in terms of the next question that we have, which is what if it will an improvement technology have on the, on the position of the production possibility gap? So obviously, uh, if we have an uh, improvement in technology, it means uh, we are able to produce more with the modern technologies that will be there. So. Uh, the product can by producing more, we are going to go see a shift of the uh, production uh, possibility curve. Remember, also, uh, when, uh, when we are uh, open the production possibility curve, we are saying the position of the production possibility curve indicates uh, for employment that is with the results that are available, that those are the maximum uh, uh, goods that we can produce. So, if uh, the uh, resources have, have, have increased in the sense of our technology, which has improved, uh, it means also the PPC has to shift outwards. So uh, that is the explanation that we have. It shifts, it shifts outwards or it's going to shift, uh, we can say, uh, rightwards according to our shape of the product, production possibility curve. Remember, uh, our production possibility curve uh, 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 looks like it's bounce outwards. It bounce outwards. So it means uh, if we are uh, to uh, have an increase in the in the um in the total goods uh, that are being produced, you are going to see it moving in uh, this direction. So it's going to uh cause a shift, which is uh, a shift outwards. So this is exactly what would transfer the uh, production possibility cave one, and then it goes on production possibility cave two, possibly. So uh, this is uh, the scenario that we have. So uh, obviously, according to the answer that we have, uh, that is explaining uh, that 
are in sense we are saying are the potentially potentially positive cable move to we'll move to the right that is outwards that is the same thing as we are trying to explain so we go to the next part of the question we are given a graph start with graph below and answer the question that for uh, we are given a demand curve which is negatively sloped and then we've got the supply curve positively sloped and then we've got the intersection point which is e uh, which is we are leading us to the equilibrium point whereby we put the price of 60 and the quantity of 30. So I'm um, going to our first question say identify one market force displayed by the above graph. So I uh, remember the equilibrium uh, point is determined by the market forces of demand and supply. So it means obviously the market forces that will be there, we have got supply force and then the demand force. So uh, this is uh, what we have. So we go to our answer section, we see that uh, uh, the answer that we have is demand or supply, which is uh, indicating the uh, forces that we have there. So we go to back to our question. The next part of the question is say, uh, what quantity, what quantity will be sold uh, in the above market? But we know that this is our equilibrium point. So the quantity is on the horizontal axis is 30. So it means 30 is the quantity. Uh, we have 30 here, which is indicating uh, the quantity. So uh, this is what we have. The next question uh, is say, uh, briefly describe the concept of equilibrium, point, equilibrium price. So equilibrium price is this one. Which is six according to this graph. So equilibrium price is the price that is determined in the equilibrium point where the uh, demand curve and the supply curve intersect. Exactly, and uh, that's what we have. And in that equilibrium point, we are going to see that um, we are going to uh, have the same quantity of demand being the same quantity of supply. Thirty is the same is thirty here, and at point E, we have got thirty is the quantity of supply, and also thirty is the quantity of demand. So uh, that's the expression that we have. So we can go and try to see the group expression that we have. We is saying this is the price at which demand and supply are the same. In other words, quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. This is exactly as we are trying to explain. So we go to the next part of the question saying, how does a perfect competitor decide on the price to sell their product? Remember, a perfect a competitor, uh, we find it in the uh, perfect uh, uh, competition market structure, whereby we are saying, uh, they don't de determine this, uh, the price of the goods, and the price of the goods are determined by the forces of supply and, and demand. So they are price uh, takers. So we go and try to see explanation that we have said a perfect competitor is a price checker. They sell their products at the market price that is determined by market forces. That is exactly as we are trying to explain. Then we go to the next uh, part of the question. They distinguish between change in quantity demanded and change in uh, demand. So you will see that up. Uh, uh, the main difference between the two is that change in quantity demanded is change along the demand curve. Change in quantity demanded is change along uh, the demand curve. For example, we've got this uh, demand curve which we have here. Uh, if we have a change from point A to point B, this indicates change uh, in the quantity uh, demand demanded. But the change in demand shifts the demand curve. So we're going to have a new uh, a new demand curve. For, for example, uh, we have a, a new demand curve coming here. And we, we see a shift uh, from uh, our D to a new demand curve. We are saying uh, maybe this is our D0, and it shifts to D1. So this one indicates change in demand. Then change in quantity demanded uh, is from uh, is change along the demand curve, like, a, a, like a, a change of position of A to B indicates change in a quantity demanded. So uh, we go to the other section and see that description, uh, which is saying uh, change in price. Uh, let me just try to see. Change in the price leads to a change in the quantity demanded, which results in a movement along the same demand curve, which is exactly as we are trying to say. Then a change in demand now come as a result of change in non-price effects. So uh, any other any other factor that is not price will cause change in demand. Uh, and we're saying, for example, change in income, which results in a shift of the demand curve. So uh, basically, that's what we have in terms of the difference that exists between credit, change in the quantity demanded and change uh in demand so we go to the uh, next part of the question which is saying 2.3 start the, the table below and answer the uh, questions that follow we are given a column for number of apples consumed column for total utility column for marginal utility so 2.3.1 reads identify the marginal utility at the fourth apple so let's shall try to see we are seeing that the fourth apple uh, apple is here which is here I remember uh, the marginal utility, we are supposed to say this total utility minus the previous total utility, then we get the marginal utility. So in this sense, we are saying 150 minus uh, 120. And obviously, you are going to get your 30. And this is your 30, which is indicating if 30 becomes uh, the um, 
the margin of return that we have. Then next question, 2.3.2, when will the above consumer experience diminish margin utility? So what is diminishing margin utility is the question. We know that diminishing margin utility is when um, the margin of utility is decreasing. So margin of utility you're having it in this column. So let's just notice where it is now starting to decrease. That's where we're going to experience um, uh, mar uh, diminishing marginal utility. So diminishing is just uh, just same as uh, reducing. So uh, if you come here, you'd see that here we have got a marginal utility of 40. And here 40, which automatically means here we also have 40. And, uh, but you see that on the, on the fourth uh on the fourth April here, that's where we're having uh, marginal utility reducing to 30 from 40 to 30. So that's where we're having diminishing marginal uh, utility. So our question is saying, when will the above consumer experience uh, diminish? So it will experience a marginal utility after the 10th April, which means after uh, 10th April, that's when now we see diminishing marginal utility. So this after consuming the 10th uh, April, that's where we have uh, diminishing marginal utility. So we go there, uh, we see that um, next question is saying, um describe the concept of diminishing marginal utility so we have just explained it as uh, when uh, the uh, marginal utility is uh, decreasing so we go there and try to see uh what explanation do we have in terms of diminishing marginal utility diminishing marginal utility means that the utility of an article decreases with every additional increase in the units of that article consumed successfully successfully one after uh, another so it means that when we um, when we add an additional unity, the uh, additional utility also that we gain from that additional unit added uh, is uh, will now decrease. So exactly as that. So we go to 2.3.4 and try to see what do we have. It says what are why are consumers prepared to pay for a good or service? It's because of the satisfaction and they gain from consuming that product. So uh, 2.3.4. Uh, this one that we'll be saying people are prepared to pay for a good or service because it gives them utility that is satisfaction. So um, this is exactly as we have, and then we try to see if we still have another question here. Um, calculate the values represented by A and B from the above table. Calculate uh, the values represented by, by A and B from the above table. But we know that from A, uh, having our A, let's just try to see. Maybe we can clear so that we can have some space here. So um, the, our question, our question is set up with the values represented by A and B. So A here, that's where we put the initial and then the majority is zero. But we know that before before A, because A is, is the uh, number of apples, you've got one apple. So it means before one, you've got zero apple. And uh, it means our total utility at zero there was also zero utility. So uh, by consuming one unit, it means uh, the total utility also uh, moved to uh, moved to A. So to find A, we are saying our our total utility for the second um, uh, for the second apple minus uh, marginal utility for better than previous marginal utility. So we are just saying eighty minus forty, then you are going to get your forty. So it means your A is is 40. And then we look at B. Uh, B is indicating marginal utility. So marginal utility, we are saying if A is 40, if we are having 40 here, it means our marginal utility here will be 80 minus 40 again. So we are saying again 80 minus 40, uh, which makes B equal to also 40. So we have all of them, they are indicating uh, 40. So we go to 2.4, discuss in two characteristics of a perfect market. So uh, we know that in a perfect market, uh, that's where we're going to see the, uh, the issue of uh, uh, firms being price takers as the price is being determined by the forces of supply and demand. Uh, so uh, that's one of the characteristics that we have. And also the existence of perfect knowledge uh, also is what, also another uh, characteristic that we see in the uh, perfect uh, market. So uh, we try to see according to the responses that we are given there. Um, one of them is saying there are a large number of buyers and sellers so that nobody can influence the market price with their uh, behavior. So large numbers of buyers and sellers also one of the key characteristics. Buyers and sellers have full knowledge and information, and information about market conditions. So the issue of having uh, full knowledge and information about market conditions is uh, the issue of, is, a, is, is the same as our perfect knowledge. So this is the explanation of perfect uh, 
uh, information. There's perfect information that exists in the perfect market, uh, which is which means there's full knowledge and information about the market condition. So we go the next one. There are no barriers to enter and exit. Buyers and sellers are free to leave or enter the market. So this is also one of the characteristics that uh, no barriers to entry. Any firm that needs to operate can operate a, a business, uh, which is different from a monopoly, whereby there are barriers. It's very difficult to penetrate a market that is operated by a monopoly. So uh, this is uh, what we have. The next one is saying all goods or services in the market are identical or homogeneous. Which is also correct. The last one, because there's no government interference in the market in order to influence our prices, you know, a government interference. So this, these are the characteristics uh, that we have in terms of uh, perfect markets. Then on the next part, saying in the end of the graph, discuss the consumers' indifference map for beef and chicken. So uh, the indifference map, uh, it's a it's a group of uh, 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 inter indifference caves. We know that any indifference cave is convex to the origin; it bows inwards. So. Uh, we are just going to uh, make make some shifts of that uh, uh, indifference cave and come up with an indifference map. So indifference map, we are just drawing uh, many indifference caves with uh, different positions. And then, but we have to take note that the indifference caves do not intersect. They do not intersect. So if you come here, you would see that this is our indifference map. This indicates a graph of an indifference map whereby you see we have an indifference cave one, indifference cave two, indifference cave three. So we have a main indifference caves on that graph that uh, uh, shows us the indifference map. And uh, if you go back to our question, it is saying uh, we are showing it for beef uh, and chicken. So we've also indicated on the axis that we have got beef on the vertical axis and chicken on the horizontal point of origin here. So uh, by using this, uh, we can now, uh, uh, with the aid of a graph, discuss. So we have to uh, show your graph, then you uh, make some notes below so that you are just discussing of what we have shown on the graph. So uh, the first point is saying it comprises of collection of different caves, which is correct. Second one, each cave shows different combinations of two products that will provide a consumer with its particular type of satisfaction. So we are saying the combination of goods that are long. Uh, if you if we consume at point A, point B, on the same different cave, we are saying. Uh, the combination of point A, that is number of beef and number of chicken, and also a point B, number of beef, number of chicken, we are going to get the same satisfaction. The same applies to uh, when you are now going to indifference cave 2, uh, we are also having the same satisfaction on different combination of goods. Same applies to indifference cave uh, 3. So um, next one is saying each cave shows numerous combination of two products that will provide the consumer with equal levels of satisfaction. That is, again, that um, the greater the distance from the origin, the higher the level of satisfaction. So we are saying if uh, indifference cave two has got a higher level of satisfaction than indifference cave uh, one, and then indifference cave three has a higher level of satisfaction than indifference cave two. So uh, we got the last one. Indifference cave in the map will never intersect and have a convex shape. So they have a convex shape, yes, and they don't intersect. That is uh, another characteristic. We should not see it uh, intersecting. So going back to our question, uh, you would see that uh, this becomes uh, the last question on this part. Uh, which uh, question is even our 40 marks. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully the video was helpful. Uh, let's not forget to subscribe and share. Let's share the link to our colleagues who are doing great chain, uh, economics. More typical examination questions are going to be uploaded on this channel. Let's stay tuned. Let's get notified. Let's turn on the notification button so that when we upload new videos, you get notified. As for this video, I'm signing out. We'll meet again in the next video.